Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden. Welcome to the Geek Group. Today we have an equipment autopsy too big for the bench, so we get to play here in the VSL. We have an IEC Sentra 7 centrifuge. The control panel is really boring. There isn't a whole lot to see, but that's what it looks like. The real show is inside. Now, I stuck a screwdriver here because the door likes to lock on it for safety reasons, but in order to ensure maximum safety, I'm just going to take the door right off of it because that's everything we want to see. Now there probably won't be a whole lot to this one because a centrifuge is basically just a big spinning system, like one motor and a spinning setup, and a whole lot of controls, and in any modern centrifuge, a whole lot of safety stuff. A centrifuge is a piece of lab equipment used a lot in chemistry. They, they use them a lot. And the idea is to separate things as the more dense stuff gets flung to the outside. They use this a lot. If you've ever had uh, blood work done, they've probably run your blood through a centrifuge. It's how they separate out different cell types, like red cells, white cells, plasma, platelets, all that fun stuff. And I've never gotten to take one apart before. And we got this beast in as part of a big equipment donation. And it doesn't work. It's, it's all kinds of screwed up. So why not autopsy it? Now I'm going to need that safety key here. So I'm going to have to take this apart. And I'm pretty sure this might have a key. No, I might be able to get around the safety key. Maybe. I'll take the top off. We'll do that. So I'll grab a Phillips head here. That might be all we need. Yes, cool. All right, so on top, We've got this with lots of air channel guides and stuff, which is not what I was expecting. There's a lot of vents on the bottom. And then sound isolation, like a dynamat type stuff. Now this, Something you'll see a lot when taking things like this apart, or washing machines sometimes have them, stuff like that. You'll see a thing like this. Now, on the latch, you've got the hinge side here, and this is the, the actual latch. And then this just pushes down. Oh, a window. There used to be a window on top. Don't need that. There used to be a window right here on top it looked like that. And it has long since fallen out. It's a little plastic window. We don't need that. So this is a safety key, and it goes in there. And it pushes the thing off to the side and probably trips something down below. I'm going to see. I don't know if I can. And for the love of God, never try this at home, because this is just stupid dangerous. But I'm going to see if I can get it to work at all by sticking the safety key in the thing. It doesn't like that even a little bit. It's angrily buzzing at me. So this isn't just a switch. There's stuff going on in there. That might do it. Wake up. 
find your center. Nope. So I gotta take that apart. Because my goal here is to make this operate in the worst possible manner it can by having the top open. Are you really? Oh, no, something fell. Okay. I'm going to take the back off. So in the back, there's another micro switch down here. I don't know what you do, but I'm curious to find out. Okay, big containment steel liner here. And this is just a blast shield. There's the actual stainless steel tub here, and then there's this big welded steel band. It's about a quarter inch thick all the way around this that really is just blast containment. If something lets go, this keeps the mess in one spot. giant hinge on the back of that thing. An air filter once, I'm guessing. All right, let's try going in the front door. I see a seam on the front, so we might be able to get somewhere. Let's see if we can get anywhere into this. This whole thing just moves without taking out any screws, which is only a little terrifying. But what I want to see is if I can get this out. All right, so I'm going to take these out, and I'll need this. Do that. I'm probably going to have to break the plastic because the only other way to get it off would to go be, I might be able to pass the whole thing through it. Yeah, that should be all right. And like every piece of chemistry lab equipment I've taken apart, it's really rusted on the inside. So you just pass that through there. And now I can get a look at everything. And that appears to be my safety interlock. But this is just a solenoid. There's no switch here. So this is just a hold down latch. I really thought that was a key switch of some kind. Okay, is there a switch up? Yes, there is. Okay. Aha. Well, I can do that. All right, let's set this here. And I will twiddle the switch. Okay, so if I hold the switch, I gotta be careful not to touch that against the metal. So you gotta do a little electronic yoga here. 
We'll set the time to 10 minutes, crank the speed to give or what four, brakes on to max. Hey, it moves! How about that? And now it's just coasting. Let's turn our time off. The brake is non-functional. So it's just gonna sit there and spin for a bit. Now, that's a big, heavy bronze rotating assembly. So you really don't wanna stick your finger in there or anything, cause it'll bite you. But, if you happen to have a convenient piece of cardboard laying around, you could do something like this. There. So the brake doesn't work. Now this is really cool. There's these, we've got hoppers that hold samples, like vials or test tubes. And the whole thing angles, you can see these pivot like that. Wow, that's a big piece of bronze. That's really cool. And some very nice bearings on it. So let's dig into it. Safety first. Ooh, you know what we should do? We should totally do this. This is the greatest idea ever in the history of science. Turn it on. Spin it up a bit. And then we'll turn it off. And see, there's, there's an electric brake in there of some kind that just isn't doing anything. So we, we're unplugged, so we're safe now. Except for the electricity being gen generated by the motor doing its thing. So here we've got just a little solenoid. And all this appears to do is lock this down. So this is the lock. It's not a safety key switch like I thought it was. And we can, oh, there's one big plug right there. And then one little plug. And then one really little plug. And that's just going to be cut. So we cut that out. It's kind of weird to have all this weight moving and just reach in like that because you don't, from my point of view, you can't see the shroud. So it's kind of weird. So on the back here, we've got some really cool old school controls. A rheostat, which is not something you get to mess with very often these days. This is the control for the brake. And a rheostat is, well, it's a potentiometer really, but it, this is a variable resistor. It's a wire wound resistor element that goes from here to here. And then you've got a wiper. So a rheostat is to resistors what a variac is to transformers. By utilizing a, a wiper on an armature, you have a somewhat infinite adjustability from all the way from there to here. And I'll do a video talking about rheostats sometime soon. That'd be a fun one to cover. We should do that. We've never done rheostats. Oh, let's get into some parts here. Oh, it squeaked. Big, beefy Molex plugs on things. It's rather tight quarters to work in. Oh, can I get it? Cool. So we've got a circuit card here. This looks like a power supply. Got a DC rectifier, filter cap, 
relay. I think this might be our motor drive. We'll set that aside because I'd like to make parts of this work later. Got a big ice cube relay in a socket. That's kind of beefy. We got 120 volts, 10 amps, quarter horsepower. It's a beefy little relay with a 120 volt coil in it. This is a current limiter here. Which is very securely mounted and is totally not just rattling around in the bottom. Take that out. So you just lift out. Gotta take that off. I'm going to need a very big socket to get that off. I'll be right back. Ta-da! So, I have a socket that'll fit it. Can I use... <laughs> this, is, this is harder than it looks. Yes! Yay inertia! All right, I didn't need that part anyway. So now I can take out the rotor, which is substantial. That's surprising. Oh, those just left out. So the rotor is a giant piece of bronze that sits on a cone, like a really simple Morse taper. It may actually be some manner of Morse taper. We'll come back to that. And then I've got the cap. Now, oh, there's a wire. What's the wire do? One wire, must be a ground. Yep, just a ground. So there's our tub. At the end of this, we make a cotton candy machine. There it is, okay. So we've got that, which we don't need. We can just cut the ground wire there. Take the motor drive wire off. Need a bigger socket. That's what I want. Hundred and fifteen volts, three thousand RPM counterclockwise, one third horsepower, six and a quarter amps. That is a beefy little motor. And I can tear the rubber isolation mounts right off it. So we don't care about those anymore. And I see there's four wires to the motor. Red, black, and two whites. Which might be field and armature. Or it might be that there's a break in there, an electric break, 
because this thing said it had a brake, and I haven't seen a brake anywhere. So if there's a brake, it's in here, and it's an electric brake. That's neat. All right, and all that's left is a really big resistor. Huh. There's a really big resistor in it. So that might be the brake. Let's pull the resistor out. Now here's a neat thing that we get to talk about that you see used a lot in uh, locomotives. Big trains use it. This is a big resistor. It's a 50 ohm resistor, FR100, 50, made by Memcore. So, oh, I'm bleeding. Cool. Um, yeah. That's very possible. Okay, let's get this out of the way and talk about what we've got here. All right. So, some of the parts we've got are the big motor assembly, which is just a really nice, beefy, very well-made motor. And it's got this polished taper on the end. You take the nut off. And the big bronze thing just slides down on here. You see this used a lot in like machine tools. Um, in fact, there's standard size tapers. Old school stuff uses Morse tapers. Modern day stuff like for CNC cutting tools net uses uh, like a, it's a cat taper or BT taper. Uh, it's a standard size like a cat 40 taper is what we use for all of our equipment here. And they make these all the way from cat 30 uh, all the way up to cat 50 and bigger. And big tapers, look they're, they're the size of a football. So this is a nice way to mount stuff on. There's no keying or anything like that, but once it goes on there, it's a solid mechanical lock because this taper is very precisely matched to the taper in there. So this is just a motor, and then we've got a wheel on the bottom here with holes in it, and the holes are spaced regularly, and they pass across this. And this is two little things, and the disc passes through like that, and on one side you've got a light, and on the other side you've got a light sensor. So when it when it pulses the light, this counts the pulses in the computer somewhere. It says, okay, go faster, go slower, go whatever. And this is the, the tachometer for the speed control circuit, which is a really simple speed control circuit. So that's the motor, and that will live again. We've got the solenoid. Now, a solenoid is the business end of a relay. It's an electromagnet with a movable armature and when you put electricity through the wires here, and it won't tell me the voltage on it, but it's probably 110, it might be 12 volts. But you put electricity through the wires, it creates a magnetic field that pulls that armature in. And this is the kachunk that you heard when we first turned the machine on. Now this is an ice cube relay. They call them ice cube relays because it's just a clear plastic box. What a relay is, is the same thing as a solenoid here. It's an electromagnetic coil and a movable armature, except on the armature, you put little wipers. In this case, there's three wipers up on top. And those move. When there's no power to it, they're pushing against another set of three contacts that hold still. And that's the normally closed position. Below these three, there's another set of three that these aren't touching yet. And these three are in the normally open position. When you apply power, it goes and these contacts open and these contacts close. And these three here, which you can see across the top, are the ones that move. And you can see the stationary contacts there. So these top three are normally closed, but the next three are normally open. And then this one doesn't. Yeah, OK. Your next three here are the electrodes, are the electrical connections for the movable contacts. So you have normally open, normally close, contacts, the movable contacts. And then on the bottom, you only have two, and these are the actual coils. So you put 120 volts through here, and this switches from these three to these three. So it's a triple pull, double throw relay. And then by how big the contacts are, how beefy the armatures are and all that, 
um, that tells you how many amps it can take. And this one is designed for uh, 10 amps. Yeah, this is designed for 10 amps at 120 volts. And that's a quarter horsepower motor. And then they can change the, the coils in here to run on different voltages like uh, 5, 6 volts, 12, 24, 48, and 120, and up and up and up. When they're this size, it's a relay. The same thing as this in a slightly different form factor and much bigger is referred to as a contactor. And we did a video on this a long time ago. You can learn all about these in that video. Over here, we've got a simple double pull, single throw switch, or do we? It looks like a double pull, double throw, but there's only two. Ah. This is a single pull double throw switch, but it's illuminated. And there was another set of wires that went to here, and those made this light up. So these three wires are a switch, single throw, double pull. And on this side, it's the illumination. Here, we've got a potentiometer that controlled the speed. And then we've got a simple analog meter, nothing special there, that's RPM times 1,000 from 0 to 6. Yeah, the RPM on the motor is only 3,000 RPM. But the RPM on the gauge goes up to 6,000 RPM. Somebody's lying to me. Over here, we've got a timer. And this is when it's turned on, there's a little motor in here. So it's a, a little gear motor. And it turns it back to zero. And then these three are the switch for is this on or off. If it's past there, it's on. If it's here, it's off. And then by how far you turn it is how far this has to turn it back. And when it gets to this position, it just turns it off. For the brake, we've got our big potentiometer that we talked about earlier, which is pretty cool. And then just two more simple switches, both of which are illuminated, both of which are push button, and both of which are like 80s vintage. Now we've got a circuit board, probably a motor driver. And then this thing, which is pretty cool, it's a solid state timer made by SSAC Incorporated in Liverpool, New York. It's 120 volts. It's rated for one amp max. And it looks like a timer that's just rigidly locked to a specific time. I don't know what it did. So now we get to talk about the cool thing. The one thing we haven't found in taking this whole thing apart is a break of any kind. What I was expecting was an electric break in here with like a, a friction pad or maybe even an old school setup like they used in the old TX reel-to-reels with the, the band break. I didn't find a break, but I found this. I found a really big resistor. This is where we get to talk about something cool. If you put electricity into this motor, the motor spins, right? So a motor, certain types, this isn't true of all types of motors, but certain types of motors, if you put electricity into them, they convert the electrical energy into electromagnetic energy and convert that into mechanical energy. So it works the other way sometimes. This only works on some types of motors. So you can try it and experiment and see what works for you. But with some types of motors, if you spin the motor and you put mechanical energy into it, you get electricity out. Because of that, with those types of motors, you can do something really cool. And try this at home. This is a fun experiment to do. And it works with the really common cheap little DC motors that you'll find in a lot of toys. If you have a motor wired up with a switch and a light, spin the motor with the switch open and the light off, and it turns pretty easy. Turn the light on, and you'll see the motor gets harder to turn as the light comes on. Because you're converting that mechanical energy into electrical energy into heat and light energy. And it has to go somewhere. So you, you feel resistance in the motor. It, you turn the motor into a generator. Well, if you have a motor being run as a generator, it's really easy to hook it up to a big resistor 
and turn that mechanical energy into electrical, into heat energy. And heat energy is really easy to do. This is called dynamic braking. You can use a resistor as a brake, in a, in a, you can use an electrical resistor as a brake in a mechanical motor by converting it to electricity and then into heat. And I think that's what this is doing. I think it's doing dynamic braking. Now you see this, and here is a fun time for you, and I totally recommend you try this. Get on YouTube. I'm pretty sure you know how to find it. And check out videos of dynamic braking failures in locomotives. Wow, does that make a mess in a hurry. Because in diesel electric locomotives, they have giant banks of resistors up on top of the locomotive. They're easy to find out where they are because it's where the big heat vents are. And when they slow down locomotives, sometimes, they don't use this all the time, because air, locomotives have air brakes as well, but they use dynamic braking a lot. And because these don't wear out as easily. And the videos of the failures of this are really cool. So I think that's what's going on here. And I think somewhere there's a stuck relay, which, by the way, you can frequently fix like this. <laughs> or something wore out or broke or something, and the dynamic braking isn't working. And I think that's why it just keeps coasting down. So that's what we learned in the autopsy was this had a failure of dynamic braking. You're going to see these bits again because I want to play with this. I, want to, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to do something probably ridiculously stupid and experiment with big motor and rotor and the wonders of G-forces. So that's today's Equipment Autopsy. Thank you for hanging out and learning all about various bits and pieces. You guys have fun. I'm Chris Bowden, and as always, we'll see you next time. If you've only seen our videos, then you've only seen the smallest fraction of what the Geek Group is. It's a place where you can craft, improve on, manufacture, repair, rediscover, test, discuss, research, and share just about any project in a one-of-a-kind massive facility with tools and equipment you might otherwise never get the chance to touch, let alone use for your own projects. The Geek Group is a learning institution. We're people with different skills, backgrounds, and perspectives, figuring out how to make ideas a reality and sharing those insights with everyone. To help you along the way and to get help from you are tens of thousands of members from around the world connected to the lab in real time through internet relay chat and live streaming video. A single-minded appetite for knowledge and a drive to create are traits common to all geeks. We found a way to amplify those traits, a way to give you the resources you need to improve lives. Get involved at thegeekgroup.org. We thank the Future Girl Foundation for the grant that made these videos possible. GIMS! And the thousands upon thousands of purchases and private donations from members and viewers like you that keep this place running. Thank you.